This is a Dynamic Network podcast. Hi, and welcome to the Dynamic Duel Podcast, a weekly show where we review superhero films and debate the superiority between Marvel and DC by comparing their characters in stat-based battle simulations. I'm Marvelous Joe. And I'm his twin brother, Johnny DC. And in lead up to Independence Day, the day after tomorrow, we are going to find out who would win in a fight between the DC superhero character of Uncle Sam, the personification of the US spirit of patriotism, versus Captain Britain, the UK's premier superhero. We're taking it back to 1776, folks. And I gotta say, I think Britain's gonna win this time. All I know is, just like in the past, US is totally stomping on Britain. Like, there's no way. Uncle Sam's going down? Never. Never. Fucking America. We'll see. Before we go over the characters' backgrounds and put their stats from simulations and find out who would win, we're gonna break down the latest comic book movie news to come out this past week of which we have three news items, the first one being the massive amount of set photos that we've gotten from the Superman film that's currently filming in Cleveland. We also got a trailer for Hit Monkey Season 2 and a trailer for the upcoming animated series Batman Caped Crusader. As always, we list our segment times in our episode description, so feel free to check out the show notes if you want to skip ahead to a particular topic. Guys, our artificially intelligent dual simulator, AJ9K, has a quick message for our listeners, so listen up. Why, hello there. Do you want even more from this podcast? Then become a part of the Dynamic Dual community on Patreon, where you can choose from three tiers. The Dynamic 2.0 tier gives you access to our Discord chat server, the Fantastic 4 tier gives you two bonus episodes each month, and the X-Force tier makes you an executive producer of this show. Lastly... The Dynamite Podcast Network tier lets you create your own podcast using this Monte Carlo simulator. Johnny and Joe will help you develop your show, provide graphic support and consultation, and get you simulation results. Pitch the twins your ideas via email at dynamicduelpodcast at gmail.com. Check it out at patreon.com slash dynamicduel. Pip pip cheerio. Thanks, AJ9K, and thanks to everyone who supports the podcast. Be sure to tune in to the other shows in the Dynamite Podcast Network this week, including Max Destruction, which pits your favorite action heroes from film and television against each other. This week, hosts Scotty and his brother Gil are reviewing Independence Day. Naturally. On the Sendro World podcast, host Zachary Hepburn speculates on fights between fan-favorite anime and manga characters. The show is currently on a season hiatus, so this is the perfect time for you anime fans to catch up on Sendro World's 40-episode library. And on the Console Combat podcast, hosts John and Dean find out who would win in fights between popular video game characters. In yesterday's episode, they found out who would win in a battle between Raiden from Mortal Kombat versus Thor. From Marvel vs. Capcom. Visit dynamicpodcasts.com or click the link in our show notes to listen to all of the shows in the Dynamic Podcast Network. But with that out of the way, quick to the no prize. A no prize is an award Marvel used to give out to fans. Our version, the Dynamic Duel No Prize, is a digital award we post on Instagram for the person that we feel gave the best answer to our question of the week. Last week, we asked... Besides Batman, what character do you most hope to see in the Penguin Max series and why? And of course, this question was a tie in to the first trailer for the Penguin series that will be coming up soon on the Max platform. We got a whopping two answers. So let's go ahead and break down our honorable mention and the no prize winner. The honorable mention goes to Miggy Matangian, who said, Hey, what's up, guys? This is Miggy. And the character I want to see the most I most hope to see in the Penguin is Arnold Flass, um, Jim Gordon's corrupt detective partner. Um, this, he was just like the first character that came to mind when I heard the question. Uh, he's from like Batman Year One. I think it would just be like great for the ground to take. They're taking with the Penguin because he's like a corrupt, corrupt detective that uh, sells drugs or takes drugs or something. Yeah, thanks, guys. Yeah, like Miggy said, Flass is a corrupt detective within the GCPD. He played a fairly heavy role in comics like Batman Year One, 
And we actually saw him in the Batman Begins movie. He was the fat cop with the beard. Yeah, he was the guy who was dropped from the fire escape by Batman in Batman Begins. Right, exactly. I figured that he would have played a major role in the GCPD television series that they were talking about doing. I think that later evolved into an Arkham series, and I'm not sure where it is right now. But yeah, it would be interesting to see other police officers besides Jeffrey Wright's Gordon pop up in The Penguin. And if any of them popped up, you would imagine it would be someone like Flass, because he probably has dealings with organized crime, given that he's corrupt. Yeah, this is a very practical answer, given that the world of the Batman and this Penguin series is very grounded and very rooted in the crime genre. Detective Flass is very much a part of that world, and it would make sense for him to show up. Great answer, Miggy. But the winner of this week's No Prize is Travis Herndon, who said, What's up, Dynamic Dudes? Travis here. Shout out to my other twin. So my answer will have to be Killer Croc. I think he can easily fit in this Batman universe. You can either have him be a bodyguard to the Penguin or some other rival gangster, or even have him be his own gangster like he was in the comic books before he became a a muscle for other people. You know, give him that same sort of like makeup that he had at Suicide Squad, and bam, you got yourself a cool Killer Croc. Yeah, the gangster-esque Killer Croc that we got in the Suicide Squad actually was not the worst interpretation of that character. I don't know if you could go that far with it for a series like The Penguin. You know, in the comics, sometimes Killer Croc is just depicted as a big guy with a skin condition. And I think you could definitely go that route for The Batman, which, again, like you mentioned, is fairly grounded. Honestly, the more Bat villains we get in here, though, the better. I would love to see Matt Reeves interpretation of all of them. Yeah, it's always hard for me to accept altered origins to characters within a gritty, grounded setting like this because it doesn't feel true to the comic book origin so like if matt reeves were to include a character like killer croc within the universe of the batman and penguin it would definitely be a different take on the character like he would just be a guy whose teeth are filed into points or something and they say he looks like an alligator or something like something really grounded and lame like that you know maybe like tattooed scales or something contact lenses that would be lame if i saw that version of killer croc i'd be like Oh, okay. They did it better in the last cinematic universe. Maybe they could retain the continuity from the Peacemaker television series and have Aquaman be a guy who fucks fish and Killer Croc is just the offspring of a relationship between Aquaman and a crocodile. Considering that was the DCEU, not going to happen. Oh, yeah, that's true. The Batman's not in the DCU. Okay, makes sense. But, uh... Also, how dare you for bringing that up again? Everyone forgot about it. You just reminded everyone. Aquaman fucks fish. So great answer, Travis. You win this week's no prize. If you, the listener, want a shot at winning your own no prize, stay tuned to later on this episode when we'll be asking another question of the week. And now that that's done, on to the news. Okay, so last week, there were leaked set photos from the Superman movie directed by James Gunn, revealing the full suit of David Cord Sweat's Superman character. Of course, we got our first look at the character a little over a month ago in a kind of a bizarre official photo of Superman sitting down like in an apartment, putting boots on with this like giant space laser in the background. People didn't love that. We commented on it and, you know, we kind of agreed that it was unusual. But I got to say, after seeing these set photos, I'm actually really loving this costume. It does look really good. I have to say it might be one of my favorites now. It's very inspired by the New 52 Superman outfit, but it has, you know, the red trunks and, of course, the Kingdom Come logo style. So it's a nice amalgam of a lot of great Superman elements over the decades. Yeah, my favorite thing, I think, is just the colors. You know, Christopher Reeves' Superman had a very, like, baby blue with, a like, a red cape thing kind of going. Henry Cavill had something that was much darker in tone. But to me, this hits a perfect blend between the two. The red is still very vibrant, but the blue is not quite as dark. It's a little bit brighter. And I think it's a great interpretation of Superman just as this bright symbol for people to look up to. Well, it's a very colorful costume, right? 
Actually, every character that was revealed in the set photos appears to be quite colorful in a comic book sort of way. Like, look at Lois Lane, who is wearing purple, and her outfit is very heavily inspired by what Lois Lane wore in the Animated Adventures cartoon. Well, not just that cartoon. Lois Lane actually wears purple a lot in the comics as well. But I love the fact that we get to see her in purple. The actress who plays her, Rachel Brosnahan, looks like the character to a T. I swear she was born to play the character. I like the colorful cast of characters that we got from the Daily Planet, including Cat Grant, Steve Lombard, Jimmy Olsen, Perry White. They all look really good. Yeah, they they all look fantastic. But my favorite look of the character that we got besides Superman is actually Mr. Terrific, a member of the JSA, although I'm not sure if he's going to be a member of the JSA in this movie. Mr. Terrific is played by Eddie Gathegi, although I didn't really recognize him from the set photos. The T mask that he wears over his face and hairstyle gives him this sort of different look, I would say. I can't wait to see like all of the T spheres moving around him, and I hope they interpret the character that way. We also got to look at Lex Luthor, played by Nicholas Holt, who looks really good in the role with the bald head. Yeah, it looks like a bunch of scratches and bruises. It looks like maybe Superman saved him from an accident or something like that. But he's also not the only villain we got to see. We also got to see the engineer. And some mysterious man in a black costume. We're not sure who he is, but uh, it looks like they're arresting Superman along with the military, which kind of harkens back to Man of Steel. But I don't know. We'll see how this plays out differently in this film. The one thing I didn't love from all of these set photos was actually Clark Kent. Yeah, the character of Clark Kent looks vastly different from Superman, which, you know, is good in terms of the disguise of Clark Kent, but his hair is like so freaking curly. uh, It makes you wonder how his transformation into Superman is possible with those two vastly different hairstyles. And I know Clark Kent is supposed to look dorky, but damn, he looks really dorky. (laughs) So you guys were making fun of his look on the discord. You were calling him Superm man, right? Insinuating that he gets a perm to be Clark Kent. (laughs) But I came up with the theory that the way he gets his hair a little bit more straight when he transforms into Superman is just by heat visioning his hands so they get really hot and just brushing them through his hair so it acts like a flat iron. Which is a horrible theory. Truly horrible. And yet it's a theory nonetheless. (laughs) But all in all, I actually really got excited by all of these photos. I cannot wait for this movie, which comes out in a year. It's going to be a really long year. That's all I know. Yeah, we don't usually comment on set photos, but if you guys have seen them online, you know that they're substantial enough to warrant commenting on. And also, you know, a few of them raise interesting discussions about the plot and the characters, especially that mysterious man in black photo. But that brings us to our question of the week. Who do you think is the mysterious man in black in the Superman set photos? And why? Record your answer at dynamicduel.com by clicking on the red microphone button in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, which will prompt you to leave us a voicemail. Your message could be up to 30 seconds long, and don't forget to leave your name in case we include you on the podcast. We'll pick our favorite answer and award that person a Dynamic Duel No Prize that we'll post to Instagram. Be sure to answer before July 6th. In Marvel news this past week, we got our first trailer for the upcoming season of Hitmonkey. This will be season two which will be released on Hulu on July 15th, all 10 episodes. Now, we reviewed Hitmonkey Season 1 when it came out, and it was actually a surprise hit. I don't think you and I had any expectations of what the Hitmonkey show would be, and we were really pleased with how the show turned out. It was a whole lot of fun. We rated it four stars, and you can listen to our review of Season 1. Season 2 looks like it's going to take place right where Season 1 left off, where Hitmonkey and his Hitman ghost mentor Bryce are fleeing Japan. They go to New York City and are in an entirely different environment in this next season. The way the first season ended, Bryce moved on to the afterlife, but made a deal with Mephisto to come back and resume as Hitmonkey's personal mentor. It looks like they just plan on fighting crime in New York City, but there's a lot of like supernatural elements going down, possibly due to Bryce's deal with Mephisto. Although I don't know if they're going to call him Mephisto in the show. I think they're just going to call him the devil. But we get introduced to some new characters, including Eunice, who is voiced by Leslie Jones. She was Bryce's former agent. Olivia Munn is going to be back this season as Akiko Yokohama, but this time she's going to be Lady Bullseye, who's going to go after Hitmonkey for his actions in Japan from the first season. 
you know, of course, Jason Sudeikis is great alongside Hitmonkey. They just have a great dynamic. The show's dialogue is one of its best features. Actually, the worst feature of the show is probably the animation. At least it was for season one. But we didn't really let that deter us from enjoying the show. But I have to say that from this trailer, season two's animation looks like they actually put a little bit more money into it. I actually really like the stylish animation of the show. I think it suits the concept and vibe that they're giving off. I am honestly really pumped for the show. I didn't even know they were making a season two until not too long ago. And I was actually really surprised because I thought that Marvel Studios was doing away with all the stuff that wasn't like in their MCU continuity. So this was a very pleasant surprise. Yeah, Hitmonkey was a holdover from the old Marvel television division, and I guess it was popular enough for them to continue the series in a season two. Yeah, I think this was one of two series that got released through that, the other one being MODOK. Right, yeah, but MODOK only had one season, which is also a shame because I actually really liked MODOK. Hitmonkey season one was great for its action, its tremendous over-the-top violence, and that humorous dialogue. It's just a great show. If you haven't checked out season one, definitely check it out and then catch up on season two and listen to our reviews. You only have a few weeks to catch up on season one because, again, season two drops on July 15th. On the DC side of animation, we got our first trailer for the first season of Batman Caped Crusader, a television series that's coming out on Amazon Prime. It was created by Bruce Timm, who also created the Batman animated series that began in the 90s. And it's very much in that same Bruce Timm style, except it definitely looks like it has a darker, more noir, more mature approach. Which, you know, if you know anything about Bruce Timm as a fan of the comics, he tends to make things that are a little bit more mature when it's not made for Saturday mornings. And this definitely looks like it's a little bit in keeping with that old Max Fleischer 1940s kind of style that he originally wanted to emulate in his Batman series. This, of course, follows Batman in his early years as a caped crusader. So we get early looks at characters like Catwoman and Two-Face. You know, we get to see him back when he was Harvey Dent. And I got to say, the character designs of villains like Two-Face and Scarecrow go so much harder than they did in the original animated series. Yeah, they're very grotesque, almost like the Dick Tracy villain approach. Yeah, which makes it feel like so much more pulpy, I would say, and so much more noir, which I didn't think would be possible, but it apparently is. The voice cast for this show is amazing. Thomas Linklater does the voice of Batman, and I'm not too familiar with his work, but he does a pretty good impression of Kevin Conroy, I would say. Yeah, he was in the Legion television series, as well as the first Fantastic Four movie as Dr. Doom's assistant. Okay, okay. So he's had quite a few roles within the superhero world. Catwoman is going to be voiced by Christina Ricci. This new version of Harley Quinn is voiced by Jamie Chung. And Diedrich Bader, who has voiced Batman in shows like Batman Brave and the Bold and the Harley Quinn animated series, is doing the voice of Harvey Dent in Two-Face. It looks like there's going to be a ton of action in this show based on this trailer where we get to see, you know, Batman slinking through mist and shadow to take down gun wielding bad guys. And there's like explosions and everything. It's pretty wild. I expect the show to be really good because, you know, Bruce Tim has already shown that he's had an incredible take on the character from his prior work, but also because it's produced by Matt Reeves and J.J. Abrams, which is fascinating. Yeah, Matt Reeves, you know, being the guy who directed the recent The Batman movie with Robert Pattinson and J.J. Abrams being a prolific director and producer in his own right. Early days Batman has always been a very interesting Batman to me, and I can't wait to see how this compares to things like Batman Begins or The Batman. Or Batman Mask of the Phantasm, which we recently reviewed just a few weeks ago, and also took place during Batman's early years as a crime fighter. Right, exactly. All 10 episodes are dropping simultaneously on August 1st on the Amazon Prime platform. So if you don't subscribe to that, definitely make sure you do it by August 1st because we'll be watching this, we'll be reviewing it, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun. But I think that does it for all the news for this episode. So let's go ahead and get into our main event where we find out who would win in a fight between the USA's Uncle Sam and the UK's Captain Britain. All 
All right, Uncle Sam versus Captain Britain. Now, this is the personification of U.S. patriotism versus the U.K.'s greatest hero. We are taking it back to the early days of America's history when they fought for independence from Great Britain. And uh, we're going to see if, you know, that sticks or if, you know, the U.K. is going to be able to annex America again due to the results of this match. Holy cow, I didn't know that much was writing on this. (laughs) Wow, who knew? Yeah, the battle was not over. This will be the final bout. We'll see what happens. Winner takes all. Down with the monarchy. Yeah, yeah. I don't know much about Uncle Sam as a comic book character, so I'll be interested in seeing what the hell this guy can do. Yeah, honestly, I didn't know too much about him prior to this. He's actually pretty fascinating. That said, I don't know too much about Captain Britain. So honestly, I don't even know if this is a good matchup. (laughs) I don't know if this is going to be completely lopsided when it comes to the simulations, but I think it's going to be fun nonetheless. To explain the methodology behind our duels, let's go to our sentient duel simulator, Alfred Jarvis 9000. AJ9K, tell our listeners how you go about determining a winner in our duel matchups. Yes, of course, sir. The way I determine a winner between the contestants is by running 1000 Monte Carlo simulations using the character's statistics. A Monte Carlo simulation is a probabilistic model used to determine outcomes through random sampling. In this case, I randomize the statistics along a normal distribution as a way to simulate the many variables that can occur during battle. The stat parameters are based on the official Marvel power grid from which the DC character's statistics are extrapolated. Additional stat categories are included such as range, damage potential, versatility and perception in order to create a more detailed and accurate simulation. The results of the 1000 simulations provide a percentage of wins for each character. The contestant with the higher percentage is declared the victor as they have a higher probability to win any given battle. In an equitable pairing, neither character should win 100% of the matches. The comic book stories have shown that there's even a way for Batman to defeat Superman, so the confidence rate of my method falls in line with the precedents that have been established in the source material. My mathematical simulations are without subjectivity or bias. Feats are not the sole consideration, nor are fan votes tabulated for determination of the winner. Thanks, AJ9K. Before we run the simulations, though, we like to break down each character's histories and abilities before improvising a scenario on how we imagine one of the 1000 simulations would play out beat for beat. And I believe it's my turn to go first with the DC character. So let me tell you all about Uncle Sam. On July 4th, 1776, shortly after signing the Declaration of Independence, three of the country's founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson, were tasked with creating a seal for the newly formed United States of America. Conspiring to imbue their seal with spiritual and mystic power, they gathered 10 other occult-minded men from the other colonies to form a group of 13, including a rational alchemist and patriot named Taylor Samuel Hawk, who led them in a mystic ritual to forge a spirit of liberty and freedom of the American dream itself. The 13th successfully bound the spirit to a powerful talisman, which became engraved with an eagle on one side and an eye of providence surrounded by 13 stars on the other. The talisman was entrusted to the care of Taylor Samuel Hawk, known as Samuel, who soon became embroiled in the Revolutionary War. While helping a wagon train of supplies get to George Washington and his troops, he was spotted by a group of Hessians, German soldiers who had been hired by the British Crown to help stop the colonial uprising in America. Risking his life to distract the Hessians from following Washington's supply wagons, Samuel goaded the Hessians into following him, though they eventually caught up and beat him and left him for dead. Dying with the American talisman in his hand, the spirit of America awakened and merged with Samuel's body, taking him as host and becoming a superpowered war hero known only as the Minuteman, who crossed the Delaware with and fought alongside Washington. After the Battle of Yorktown, the spirit faded, but would return when needed. In the War of 1812, the spirit was known as Brother Jonathan, who rallied American troops once again to defend against British retaliation. At the start of the Civil War, the talisman was split into two pieces, resulting in the manifestations of brothers Billy Yank and Johnny Reb, spirits of the North and South. 
By the 1870s, the two halves of the talisman eventually came into possession of a man named Samuel Augustus Adams, a New York cartoonist who criticized a powerful and corrupt Democrat politician named William M. Tweed, aka Boss Tweed, who had Sam Adams assassinated. As Sam lay dying, both talisman halves in hand, the spirit of America bound itself to him, creating the first incarnation of the enduring entity known as Uncle Sam. Wait, is Uncle Sam the propaganda character actually based off of Sam Adams? It's a different Sam Adams, not the one you're thinking of. Not the guy who makes the beer? No, not that one. <laughs> I, I see. A second incarnation of Uncle Sam emerged during World War I, when the spirit of America was once again bound to a dying American patriot. And a third incarnation emerged in World War II, during which time he had a young sidekick named Buddy Smith. After Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor, Uncle Sam created and led a super team known as the Freedom Fighters, which later became a part of a larger wartime super team, the All-Star Squadron. After World War II, racial division, political assassinations, and foreign wars, among other things, fragmented the American talisman into smaller and smaller pieces over the decades as postmodern America's sense of self deteriorated. Eventually, an occult group known as the National Interest performed a ritual to create a sinister spirit known as Legal Entity to collect all the fragments of the American talisman. Eventually, they succeeded, though their ritual to summon the American Dream produced instead a corrupted version that called itself the American Scream. This entity, however, was defeated by a new spirit of America, one formed by 13 American individuals across the spectrum of race and age that were joined together in a Native American ritual to form an entity known as Patriot. Over time, Patriot became the new incarnation of Uncle Sam, who formed a new version of the Freedom Fighters, though it wasn't long before he and the team were seemingly killed by the Seeker Society of Supervillains. The Spirit of America survived, however, and Uncle Sam later emerged from the Mississippi River. Disturbed by the violent natures of his former teammates, who now all worked for a US military organization known as SHADE, or the Superhuman Advanced Defense Executive, Uncle Sam convinced them to defect from SHADE and join him in protecting people as the Freedom Fighters. Eventually, the Freedom Fighters and Shade joined forces, and Uncle Sam became the new head of the organization. After the Flash reset DC's continuity, the multiverse was re-established, and on an alternate universe of Earth-10, or Earth-X, the Nazis were never defeated and they conquered the planet. In that world, Uncle Sam and his Freedom Fighters fought back against the Nazi occupation of America, though on a day known as Red Friday, they were all killed including, seemingly, Uncle Sam, who faded away. Believing Uncle Sam was still alive, Adolf Hitler became obsessed with finding him, as did a new incarnation of the Freedom Fighters that eventually formed, who were inspired by the old team and managed to awaken the spirit of America when they blew up a version of Mount Rushmore with the faces of Hitler and other prominent Nazis carved into it. At that moment, the spirit of Uncle Sam rose from a grave within an extra-dimensional realm of ideas known as the Heartland, home to other national personifications such as Britannia, Marianne, Hispania, and Johnny Canuck, all of whom had also seemingly died. Alongside the Freedom Fighters, Uncle Sam managed to deal enough blows to the Nazis to awaken the other personifications and save the planet from Nazi rule. And that's Uncle Sam's backstory so far. Powers-wise, Uncle Sam possesses super strength, speed, and durability commensurate with the United States' faith in the ideals of liberty and freedom. Typically, he's been shown to lift around 50 tons, though he can lift proportionately more when he grows in size. He can grow as tall as a skyscraper and shrink to 6 inches. He could also generate portals to teleport himself and others to and from the Heartland Pocket Dimension. And he has limited clairvoyance and telepathy, able to hear and speak through other people's minds, remotely perceive major events going on within the United States, and sense the location of important patriotic artifacts such as the Declaration of Independence. He is, in a sense, immortal, 
and that even though his body can be killed, his spirit will find a new host body as long as American patriotism exists. And that's Uncle Sam. You would have to think that Uncle Sam in this current political climate is probably weaker than he's ever been, though, right? So he's just going to be a pipsqueak by this point. Dude, I freaking love America. What are you saying? <laughs> How and that dare is you? as political as the show will ever get. Thank goodness. That well, said, nowadays, you know, Uncle Sam would probably be splinted to one would be called Mega Man and the other one would be called The Progressive. I'd read that comic. Honestly, that'd be pretty interesting. I just got to say that Captain America will always be a better symbol of American freedom than this Uncle Sam guy will ever be. What? Just for the record. Oh, my gosh. He's literally Uncle Sam. Who cares? Steve Rogers. And I'll say that no one can represent the UK quite like Captain Britain. Let me get into his backstory. Now, Brian Braddock was born in Malden, Essex in the United Kingdom. His father was Sir James Braddock, a champion of the realm of Avalon, which is similar to the realm of Asgard, where Thor is from, but Avalon is Celtic in nature as opposed to Norse. Sir James Braddock was a knight who was sent by the wizard Merlin to Earth's realm in order to sire the hero Captain Britain, who would serve as the guardian to Avalon's gateway hidden within the British Isles. Sir James sired a pair of twins, Brian and his sister Betsy. While it was his sister Betsy that would develop mutant abilities and later be known as Psylocke, it was Brian that would eventually take on his birthright to become Captain Britain. You can learn more about Psylocke in her duel against Gorilla Grodd. Brian's time to don the mantle came shortly after his parents died. While he was attending Thames University in London, a mercenary named Reaver and his crew raided the physics research lab that Brian was studying at in order to steal the experiments. Brian fled the scene on his motorcycle, but was chased down by the mercenaries and rode off a cliff. Bleeding and dying, Brian was visited by the wizard Merlin and his daughter, known as the Lady of the Northern Skies. Telling him that he could live to serve as Great Britain's protector, they offered Brian a choice between two magical artifacts, the Sword of Might or the Amulet of Right. Seeing himself as more of a scholar than a warrior, Brian chose the Amulet of Right, which transformed him into Captain Britain and bestowed on him great strength and the Star Scepter, which allowed him to fly and create magic force fields. The mercenary Reaver happened upon the scene and grabbed the other artifact, the Sword of Might, which transformed the mercenary into an armored knight. Brian fought and defeated Reaver and his mercenary crew, passing his first challenge as a hero. He would go on to fight other threats to Great Britain, including Lord Hawk, the Black Baron, and the Lurker from Loch Ness. He partnered with other heroes such as Captain America to defeat the Red Skull who had come to Great Britain. During a flight over the English Channel, Brian was attacked by Merlin's foes, the Nether Gods, who forced his plane to crash into the water. He washed ashore on Cornwall Beach, where the hero known as the Black Knight discovered him, and the two traveled to Camelot in Avalon, where together they saved King Arthur's former kingdom from the evil wizard Mordred. After returning back to Earth, Brian's abilities were altered by Merlin so that the magic power of his amulet and scepter were imbued into Brian himself letting him use his powers without the need of magic artifacts. At one point, he gave up his Captain Britain mantle and passed it on to his sister Betsy, who at the time had not yet joined the X-Men and was not quite ready for the task. She nearly died in battle with an assassin called Slaymaster, forcing Brian to kill the villain. He resumed his mantle as Captain Britain, and his sister soon joined the X-Men, where she became the quintessential hero, Psylocke. When several of the X-Men, including Psylocke, apparently died, Brian was distraught and was inspired by Nightcrawler to form a British mutant team called Excalibur. The initial Excalibur team consisted of Captain Britain, Nightcrawler, the mutant Kitty Pride, aka Shadowcat, Brian's lover Megan, who was a mutant shapeshifter descended from mythical fairies, and an alternate universe version of Jean Grey and Cyclops' daughter from the Days of Future Past timeline called Rachel Summers, who also went by Phoenix. Excalibur quickly became Britain's premier superhero team. When they traveled to the US to aid the remaining X-Men against the Goblin Queen, Brian learned that his powers were linked to the British Isles, and that the further he journeyed from them, the more his powers waned. He was then given a new costume, which acted as a battery of sorts, storing mystic energies from Great Britain so that he could more easily use his powers away from his homeland. 
This inadvertently caused Brian to grow in size during a time of cosmic convergence, when multiple realities aligned and Brian's suit absorbed the mystical energy of a multitude of Great Britons. The Excalibur team used this excess energy to defeat a wizard named Necrom, who tried to use the convergence to become omnipotent. Brian later learned that his sister Betsy was alive, and that she had used one of Merlin's artifacts known as the Siege Perilous to let her and several other X-Men escape death through a mystic portal. Brian later married Megan in a ceremony in Avalon, and Excalibur disbanded. After being attacked by warriors from Avalon, they journeyed to the realm where Brian received a message from his father, Sir James, that as Captain Britain, Brian was the rightful heir of Otherworld, which was a magic dimension that housed the realm of Avalon. Wielding the blade of Excalibur, Brian and Megan ruled over Otherworld for a time, passing the Captain Britain mantle to a British woman named Kelsey Lee, offering her, in a moment of near death, the choice between the Sword of Might and the Amulet of Right. She chose the sword and served on the Avengers until the team was disassembled by the Scarlet Witch in a fit of madness. Brian eventually returned to Earth and formed a new Excalibur team. During the Alien Skrull's secret invasion of Earth, they tried to invade Avalon through the Siege Perilous portal in order to control Earth's magic. Brian and Excalibur fought and defeated the aliens and went on to stop other threats such as the vampire Lord Dracula, whom you can learn more about in his duel against Andrew Bennett. Brian left Excalibur for a short stint, which at this point was rebranded as MI-13. He joined the Avengers and later a secret group of influential heroes called the Illuminati. When Captain America's history was rewritten by the reality warping Cosmic Cube so that he was a secret member of Hydra, Captain Britain led a team of European heroes to fight against Hydra's takeover of America. You can learn more about this event in our Commander Steel vs. Captain America duel episode. After the mutant population established their own nation on the sentient island of Krakoa, Brian visited his sister Betsy, who at this point had resigned the Psylocke identity to the Japanese assassin Quanin. Together, Brian and Betsy journeyed to Avalon, where Brian was put under a spell by the Arthurian sorceress Morgan Le Fay. Betsy claimed her brother's Amulet of Right to reassume the Captain Britain mantle. She formed her own version of the Excalibur team and defeated Morgan Le Fay, leaving Brian to claim the Sword of Might, and he took on the new title of Captain Avalon, his current moniker. I assume Betsy is going to retain the title of Captain Britain from here on out, considering she can no longer be Psylocke, and considering she's more popular than her brother Brian. But since we've already done a duel with Betsy slash Quanin as Psylocke against Gorilla Grodd, for this duel against Uncle Sam, I'll be going with Brian as Captain Britain. Powers-wise, Captain Britain gains his abilities from the magical energy stemming from the gateway to Avalon located in the British Isles. Traditionally, that meant that the longer the time and distance he gets from Great Britain, the weaker his power. However, this limitation has been resolved by the Lady of the Northern Skies through the use of magic. Captain Britain has enough strength to lift around 100 tons, he has enhanced agility and enhanced durability through a magic invisible force field that encases his body. He occasionally projects this force field from his body as a ranged attack. Captain Britain can fly up to sonic speeds and has enhanced hearing and telescopic sight. Finally, he has a genius level intellect as an accomplished physicist and engineer. And that's Captain Britain. I thought for some reason his power set was way different. I thought he like shot lasers and stuff for some reason. <laughs> no, you might be thinking of Vindicator, who's like the Canadian version of Captain Britain. Oh, maybe. Yeah. Wait, who the hell is Union Jack? Isn't he a guy? Yeah, he's also a British hero, but he's not Captain Britain. They all look alike. Well, I mean, yeah, they both wear the British flag, but you should try not to be racist. Freaking redcoats, all of them. I don't think Uncle Sam would appreciate what you're saying. Dude, Uncle Sam loves punching red coats. It's what he <laughs> does. In a world where fantasies collide and heroes clash, one podcast network rises above the rest. Prepare yourself for the ultimate showdowns in comic books, video games, movies, and anime. The Dynamite Podcast Network presents Console Combat, where video game legends brawl every Monday. Dynamic Duel, where comic book titans smash every Tuesday. Max Destruction, where TV and action heroes battle every Wednesday. And Sendro World, where anime champions clash every Thursday. 
Join us as we speculate on the matches and, armed with the power of mathematical simulations, discover who will emerge victorious. Visit dynamicpodcast.com where we settle the debate and settle the score. Well, now that we got their histories and abilities out of the way, let's speculate on how one of the 1,000 simulated matches will go. The winner is determined by simulations, not the speculation, but it's fun to imagine how the fight could play out. AJ and IK, what are the rules of our speculation? Well, I should say there are no rules, other than the characters have no prior knowledge of the other going into the fight. All they are aware of starting out is that the other character is a threat that needs to be eliminated. For the speculation, the contestants will begin approximately 50 meters apart in a nondescript environment that will have no bearing on the match itself, as no environmental statistics are considered in my simulations. The contestants must earn victory on their own merit. All right, then, let's get into it. Uncle Sam and Captain Britain meet on the battlefield. Who goes first? I'm going to say that Captain Britain goes first because he can, you know, fly up to sonic speeds. So he's going to start off by blitzing Uncle Sam and he's just going to rock that old man with the massive haymaker. Uh, Elder abuse. (laughs) Actually, I don't think Uncle Sam is that old. Uh, I think he just has white hair, but I think he's actually like a middle aged man. But anyway, Uncle Sam, you know, he gets knocked down, uh, but he's going to get back on his feet. He's going to dust himself off and roll up his sleeves. And he's going to be like, all you've done is awaken a sleeping giant. And he's going to grow into his giant size right away and grab Captain Britain like he's an action figure and just crush him in his grasp. I mean, he, he'll try to crush him in his grasp, but Captain Britain's force field is going to keep him from getting crushed. So he's going to slip out of Uncle Sam's grasp and then he's going to fly over his head and Captain Britain's going to grab Uncle Sam by his back collar and he's going to flip this geezer right onto his ass with a big old massive crash. Okay, but from the ground, you know, Uncle Sam's going to swat at Captain Britain with his top hat and actually he's going to trap him in it. And Uncle Sam's like, all men are created equal, except for you, pipsqueak. (laughs) And he's just going to like throw his hat on the floor and just stomp on it, just crushing Captain Britain beneath his boot. Oh, wow. Oh, geez. All right. Um, But Captain Britain is strong enough to burst out of this hat and he's going to catch Uncle Sam's boot as it's trying to stomp on him. And then he's going to like Mario 64 him. He's going to swing him around and around and around (laughs) by the leg. And he's going to release him, which is going to send Uncle Sam tumbling across the battlefield. And that'll probably cause him to shrink back down to his normal size. And that is when Captain Britain's going to follow up and fly over to Uncle Sam, who's on the ground, and he's going to teabag him. Just like dunk (laughs) his nuts right on his face repeatedly. (laughs) And he's going to be like, tea time, tea time. (laughs) Well, Uncle Sam's going to be like, no taxation without representation, bitch. <laughs> and he's going to grab <laughs> Captain Britain by his nuts and just throw him into the harbor. Harbor? What, yeah. what harbor? The uh, the Boston Harbor. Duh. <laughs> There's no environment here. I don't know what you're talking about. Captain Britain gets thrown by his sack, but he's going to land on the ground. <laughs> probably feeling a little bit sick to his stomach. You know, probably feels like he's going to puke. Yeah, and while Captain Britain is recovering, that's when Uncle Sam is going to run up to him and just start pounding him with his fists, yelling, for life, liberty, and the pursuit of kicking your ass. Boom! (laughs) Captain Britain is knocked out. No, because before Uncle Sam can knock Captain Britain out, he's going to project his force field as a projectile. It's going to blast Uncle Sam away, and then Captain Britain's going to follow that up with a flying kick to Uncle Sam's dumb goatee. Actually, Captain Britain, he's just going to fly and kick straight into the heartland because Uncle Sam's going to generate this swirling red, white and blue portal that Captain Britain just essentially falls into. So now they're both in Uncle Sam's dimension, this like idealized Norman Rockwell-esque farm with like bald eagles in the sky. But uh, in this world, Uncle Sam, he has some degree of reality manipulation. So he's going to summon like a whole bunch of firework explosions that just blast Captain Britain. He's like, give me liberty or I'll give you death. (laughs) Does he speak in quotes like that? Sometimes. (laughs) All right. So Captain Britain is getting blasted by these fireworks. But to avoid them, he's going to use the Siege Perilous artifact from Merlin to transport himself and Uncle Sam to the realm of Avalon. 
And once they're there, the Lady of the Lake, she's going to throw the Sword of Might to Captain Britain, who's going to catch it and then run the blade right through Uncle Sam's torso, just impaling him and ending the match. Wait, so the Siege Perilous is an artifact? Yeah, yeah, it's like a brooch that grows to become a doorway. Yeah, an eagle snatches it from Captain Britain before he could even use it. So what? The match was already over. I don't know what to tell you. Well, if the eagle snatches it before they could transport to Avalon, then that means that this eagle just exploded in the fireworks as they're going off. Hey, that eagle died for his country, sir. <laughs> that eagle is a patriot. I'm going to say that the actually the eagle died from the firework explosions before it could snatch the Siege Perilous. So, yeah, Captain Britain wins. He takes them both to Avalon. And then Uncle Sam gets impaled. Okay, I guess we'll leave the match there. Either Uncle Sam gets impaled by the Sword of Might in Avalon, or Captain Britain gets bombed by a whole bunch of fireworks in the Heartland. Let's go ahead and input the character stats, run the simulations, and find out which of these events happens when we come back with a winner. AJ9K, hit it! Inputting data, running calculations, processing results, simulations complete. All right, this is a pretty close match, you know, considering that neither of us really knew much about the other character, but the executive producers picked this one out, and I think it was a good call. Yeah, I mean, powers-wise, they were pretty similar, and that, you know, they're both really strong, and they could even teleport to, like, other fantastical realms. That's crazy. But stat-wise, they were similar as well. Yeah, we said they had about the same fighting skill and versatility, but we said Uncle Sam is faster, more durable, stronger, and capable of more damage and also greater perception because he has like limited omniscience over the country. Right, exactly. We also said Captain Britain was more evasive. He had a greater range because Uncle Sam has no projectile attacks, basically. And surprisingly, Captain Britain was more intelligent than Uncle Sam. So taking all of the stats into consideration, Joseph, who do you think came out on top? I think that this is the day Britain finally wins. I think they're going to get their sweet revenge for what happened all those centuries ago. And America's going down. Why do you hate America, sir? I don't hate America, but I do love Marvel. And Marvel has Captain Britain, who I'm representing in this match. You're a traitor to your country? Well, I mean, I'm not the only one who thinks that Captain Britain will win because according to the Instagram poll results, uh, it's an even split 50-50. That's only because I put the poll up late because we're recording a little bit early and not enough Americans have seen the poll yet. <laughs> but let's find out who won. AJ9K, the results, please. Here you are, sir. The winner of the matchup between Uncle Sam and Captain Britain is... Uncle Sam, bitch! We lost again! <laughs> Dude, you're American. What are you talking about? <laughs> Uncle Sam won 546 out of the 1,000 matches, or 54.6% of the time, compared to Captain Britain, who won 45.4%. That's pretty close, though. It was close. Too close, if you ask me. You don't think there's any bias at play here with having America win on the 4th of July, is there? Well, I mean, unless AJ9K is biased, unless, you know, math is biased. I guess math just loves America. <laughs> and you know this is actually really fitting because this upcoming week i'm traveling to our nation's capital washington dc i'm putting a new meaning to dc in johnny dc and i would have been really embarrassed if i had to show my face there with captain britain winning i mean you should probably never show your face anywhere if we're being honest dude my face looks like your face oh shit that was a self burn wasn't it I guess that does it for this duel. AG9K, help close us out. Thanks for listening to Dynamic Duel. Visit the show's website at dynamicduel.com and follow us on Instagram at Dynamic Duel Podcast. You can support the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash dynamicduel and joining a tier that works for you or by rating and reviewing Dynamic Duel on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podchaser or on our website. Don't forget to listen to the other shows in the Dynamite Podcast Network including Max Destruction, Senjo World, and Console Combat. In our next episode, we will be reviewing a Marvel animated direct-to-video feature, Hulk vs. Right, and the executive producers chose that movie to review because it features a Wolverine vs. Hulk fight, and Wolverine's going to be appearing in the Deadpool and Wolverine movie coming out at the end of this month. So look forward to that. 
But that does it for this episode. We want to give a big thanks to our executive producers, Ken Johnson, John Starosky, Zachary Hepburn, Dustin Balcom, Maggie Mathingian, Brendan Estergaard, Nathaniel Wagner, Levi Yaton, Austin Wiselowski, AJ Dunkerley, Scott Camacho, Gil Camacho, Adam Spees, Andrew Schunk, Dean Molesky, Devin Davis, and Joseph Kirsting for helping make this podcast possible. We'll talk to you guys next week. Up, up, and away. True believers. America, fuck yeah.